Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. This is our second CPP event of the year. Um, as a reminder, if you missed the first one uh, last month, we had uh, Mayor Andy Burnham, uh, Lord David Willits, David Goodhart, and CPP's own Zoe Billingham uh, talking about levelling up in the role of education and skills. So do check that out on the website. Um, a reminder that, as always, we'll be recording our session. It'll be broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll be tweeting as usual from at Centre Pro Policy, so do join in and use the hashtag, hashtag CPP Devolution. Um, we're looking forward to hearing your questions later, so please use the Q&A function and we'll weave those in in the second part of the discussion. Our guest today leads, needs little introduction, but I'll give you uh, some highlights that re uh, are relevant to today's conversation. Lord Michael Heseltine has devoted much of his long and illustrious career to the question of regeneration and regional growth. A member of parliament for 35 years, former cabinet minister and deputy prime minister, he is arguably the grandfather of levelling up, famously devising 30 ideas for Liverpool's regeneration after the Toxis riots. More recently, he has written his own version of what government industrial strategy should look like and a paper on devolution commissioned by the mayoral combined authorities called Empowering English cities. We'll be having a, a conversation over the next hour and I'll be touching on a wide range of topics but the running thread will be devolution. I was actually in cabinet office when Lord Heseltine's report No Stone Unturned was presented to government and as the coalition started to grind to a halt towards the end of its term I left to direct the City Growth Commission that was chaired by Jim O'Neill. When I spoke to leading devolutionary figures at the time, I soon realised how big an undertaking it was going to be to shift decades of deeply ingrained mutual distrust between central and local government. I was therefore pleasantly surprised when we and others, many of whom are on this call, what, what we were able to achieve, expanding on city deals and growth deals with a range of devolutionary deals to, to newly formed mayoral combined authorities. It was the birth of the Midlands engine and the Northern powerhouse, or what we had more clumsily called Man Chef Leeds Paul. The last devolution deal was in the tail end of the May administration, which despite promising words on the steps of Downing Street, would oversee the quiet suffocation of the devolution agenda. But COVID sparked a summer of place-based devolution revival, with political figures and the media on both the left and right finding fairly high degree of consensus on what was needed to support strategic economic and social policy decision-making at a sub-national level. Mayoral standoffs with central government showed Whitehall, Westminster and the general public how far we had come. Yet, as now Lord Jim O'Neill said to the D APPG on devolution, which published its report yesterday, devolution tends to come unstuck when politicians of all colours fear they're about to give power to their opponent, opponents. Radical reform won't happen without ministerial and MP support, yet CPP's own analysis has shown that over half Conservative constituencies in former Red Wall areas are run by Labour councils. The incentives are perhaps few and far between, forgive it for Boris handing power to Andy Burnham, or MPs getting behind greater powers for local councils of the opposite hue. How will we crack this? How will we achieve levelling up without place-based devolution? Could city regional mayors solve the English question and in turn protect the union? My own devolution journey has so far culminated in the creation of the Centre for Progressive Policy, a think tank dedicated to inclusive economic growth, which put where place and place-based leadership is central to our approach. Today, I'm delighted to turn to Lord Heseltine for his reflection on his own much longer devolution journey and what this means in today's current context, preoccupied as we are by the ongoing economic and health crisis caused by COVID-19. So Lord Heseltine, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Can I just check that I've appeared on the screen because I haven't appeared on my screen? We can see. <laughs> it's all, yeah. all working perfectly well, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I'm delighted to have a chance to uh, take part in your uh, forum for uh, the next hour on devolution. Uh, and um, frankly, it, I'm extremely sad because it's quite obvious to me that the whole momentum has gone out of the devolution agenda. And if anyone wants sort of evidence of that, well, I've just had two parliamentary questions I've put down. And the first was to 
ask when the government uh, intend to publish their devolution white paper, to which the reply uh, is the wonderful civil service jargon. I'd never let this have gone through if I was a minister. That is why we intend to bring forward the devolution and local, local recovery white paper in due course. Well, here we are. The crisis of COVID, the crisis of Brexit, and all they can tell us is that in due course they will bring forward a white paper. And then, and then you will all remember that uh, uh, the promise in the manifesto was that the powers that had been given to the uh, Metro Mayor of Manchester would be levelled up across the other conurbation mayors. So I put down another question, which was very simple. Uh, and it says, further to the devolution of powers, um, uh, which powers, if any, have been devolved to other metro mayors since December 2019? And it, it, they, they talk about the new authorities in Sheffield and Leeds, but the answer to my question is none. There have been no new powers granted to the conurbation mayors. So, you know, given the, the way in which uh, under David Cameron, George Osborne and Greg Clark pursued this agenda in, in the most imaginative way, really since uh, the mayor of London was created under Tony Blair. And that took an age since the Redcliffe Maud report of the 1960s identified what Britain really ought to have by way of local government. Uh, when I first got involved in all this, there were one and a half thousand local authorities. And they reflected the real world that if you wanted to travel, you could get on a horse or you could walk uh, in the 18th century. But uh, of course, life has changed out of all recognition and nothing more so than this particular program. I mean, there may be people from all over the world who chimed in on, on what's happening here. Um, but anyway, under David and George, there was a, a, a real shift. Um, and the promises, I'd hoped that Boris, Boris Johnson, as an ex-mayor of London, where he did rather a good job, uh, would have pushed forward all the indications coming out of Whitehall. And now these parliamentary answers make it quite clear that we're back in the old rut where central government works out schemes, devises plans, and makes offers to a very wide ranging group of local authorities, many of them too small to be able to cope with the problems they've got. Um, but it's a civil service designed, ministerial determined Whitehall impost. And that really has got completely misses the point of devolution, which is to fire up and enthuse the uh, strengths and opportunities of our economy across the country. Um, well, if ever there was a moment, uh, it's Brexit. Uh, Brexit has been hidden behind COVID and the government I think is doing uh, a commendable job in coping with COVID and the, the figures are going the right way and, and the vaccine is the only real solution to this horrendous uh, uh, threat. But underneath and behind that is Brexit. And by any standards, Britain's economy has to change. I personally think it's a disaster, but, but uh, uh, let's put that on one side because that's an element of, uh, of a bigger picture. Uh, but if you're going to cope with the new post-Brexit world, you have to mobilize every strength you can find and eradicate every weakness that is to be there. And the idea that Whitehall understands what these are in Manchester, Liverpool, Tees Valley, uh, uh, Bristol, Cambridge, is just uh, unrealistic. And certainly, it, Whitehall cannot lead in these circumstances. The lesson I learned in Liverpool and in London Docklands, where we began this huge regeneration process, first of all, you have to have somebody in charge. Secondly, you have to have powers of land acquisition and planning. And thirdly, you have to cover an area big enough to be able to identify the economic strengths and weaknesses and opportunities of that particular coherent economy. Uh, that's why devolution is so exciting. And the other point I would make, 
I cannot think of an advanced economy in the world, the sort of model that we ourselves would quite rightly be, that isn't actually based on devolution to identifiable economies led by elected mayors all over the world. That's the way they do it, except one exception here, where we plan it all in Whitehall, design it in Whitehall, and direct it from Whitehall. Thank you. What a great opening and those real clear three things that you feel are sort of underpin economic success, leadership, powers and the right unit of geography. A couple of questions that, that come from that. Um, do you think that re government relocating departments outside of Whitehall to Darlington and Wolverhampton in particular will, will make a difference? And, and the other question is, you know, the, the Conservative Party won big in towns in 2019, and towns have been at the forefront of a lot of the government's thinking, including through the, the Towns Deal Fund. But towns might not necessarily be the right level of geography, based on what you, you said previously. How do you think that might play as a tension to government achieving levelling up? Well, of course, the... Uh, the towns are with their own pride and uh, their own history. And uh, it's important that they should be involved in the process of levelling up. But uh, many of those towns are within bigger conurbations and the interflow of the economic activities are... Uh, really need to be designed and led on a bigger scale. Um, we all know of the sort of the old mill town, Lancashire uh, towns. Um, they are part of a bigger economy. They need the cross fertilization of the center of Manchester, for example, uh, in, in, if we talk of Manchester. Uh, but it's true in the, in the West Midlands, if you're talking about uh, uh, the centre of Birmingham. The, the, in the centre of these cities, there was usually powerful units of economic generation, maybe universities, maybe hospitals, maybe headquarters of companies, whatever it is. And so using those engines of regeneration in order to spread wealth more widely and devolving power within the local economy is an essential ingredient of why you need this coherent area and why you need leader, a leader who can actually see the whole picture as opposed to simply fight for a small part of the picture. Uh, and, and then if you go to the, to the uh, particular smaller unit, what are you going to find there? You're going to find a council with perhaps 50 or 60 councillors, all arguing for their own place in the sun and without the coherent leadership. And, and, and I must say this, often with a very divided political uh, controlling system where uh, whatever one side does, the other side criticizes. And, and so having one person in charge and identified is a very important part of the leadership ingredient. And that leadership ingredient must be able to go to the various components of the economy. I've mentioned universities, there's the third sector, there's charities, there's the huge contribution of the private sector uh, and all the resources of the public sector. You have to mobilize all of that and find the way in which you can spark off partnerships, initiatives, bigger vision from that particular context of leadership. And I, I saw it in Liverpool in 1981 in the starkest way. Everybody knew what was wrong. You were wrong, they were wrong, he was wrong, she was wrong. The one thing that was never wrong was me. But of course, in my philosophy of life, show me the problem, show me the person in charge. And that was the real problem of Liverpool. There was no one in charge. That's why I created these agencies, development corporations, why in slum clearance in the 1990s, City Challenge had to have a definable leader in order to regenerate those very deprived areas. Um, and as I say, I can't repeat it often enough, 
every other model in the world is based on this in similar economies. I want to come back to leadership in a, in a minute, but um, do, do you think that um, the relocation of, of Whitehall, whether that's sort of back office or policy, um, do you think that that will play any part in increasing spatial awareness, as it were, in government? Uh, well, you did ask that question. I didn't address it. Look, if you move a group of highly talented and well-paid civil servants into an area, it's bound to have an economic regenerating effect. But uh, uh, the, the question is, let's assume that's an outpost of transport. Well, they will be experts on transport and, and fine. But what about their po colleagues who don't get moved? Um, and so immediately you realize that this is an initiative based on the functional structure of Whitehall, that someone gets a, some treasury people, someone gets some transport people, someone gets some housing people. All, yes, small fires, I accept at once, that light a, 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 some sort of spark. But that's not the problem. The problem is that these Whitehall baronies are structurally divided. So they think about transport. They don't think about how that can galvanize and, and, and gear up a range of other initiatives which are identified at the same time. If you're going to have a, a transport initiative, you want to see the consequences on housing. You want to know whether there's a possible industrial estate. You want to know whether an investor, an inward investor, would react in some positive way. So coordinating the functions of Whitehall is an effective and a central part of the devolution agenda. And that is not met by moving functional groups of civil servants to individual parts of the country. Do you think there needs to be a minister? a minister or a ministry for the English regions or a minister for levelling up or some kind of uh, version thereof in central government? Well, if I was able to define I, what I would do at once would be to create a cabinet committee of the ministries that are relevant to regeneration. I would put a senior cabinet minister in charge of it and I would mirror that in the big regional centres of the country. You, if you just imagine your mayor of the Midlands, and West Midlands or your mayor of Manchester. You want to launch an initiative. You have to make about 10 different phone calls to 10 different ministries to see whether they're on side. And there's nobody coordinating that central government response in close to the individual economies. There should be. So, a senior cabinet minister, a cabinet committee with the clout to deliver, and a, an outpost of that cabinet committee in the big centres of, of our country. I mean, we began this journey in, I suppose, 15 years ago, something of that sort, but it's all gone now. And, and uh, the, the, the co-location of the offices that took place has been split up again. I mean, it's completely incoherent. Well, I wanted to, to, to think more about um, leadership, both on the part of um, Westminster politicians and the role of MPs, and then at a local level. So I mentioned in my introduction um, the fact that it can be quite difficult to incentivize um, Westminster politicians to give power to, um, predominantly at the moment, Labour politicians um, in the sub in the sub regions. So how do we persuade kind of Boris essentially that Andy Burnham is a good thing? And similarly, how do we persuade MPs, particularly say in formal red wall areas, that they want to be um, allowing their local councillors in all the with, with all the um, positive and, and downsides of the type that you described to really make this happen? Well I, I look, you, you've asked a, 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 a bullseye question. Uh, is narrow party politics going to hold up the evolution to a, a, a flourishing democracy in our country? 
uh, on, based on devolution. And, and it's a bullseye question because the real world is that since the Redcliffe Maud report, the, the, the very points you've made have been the hurdles which we haven't jumped. And I've been involved at every twist and turn of it. And by and large, local councillors are against devolution because it tends to lead to bigger authorities and it leads to uh, um, uh, directly elected mayors, which they don't like because it diminishes their role. MPs don't like it because the, the local mayor becomes more important than they are in their area. And so they all find a million reasons why this thing shouldn't happen and why local uh, arrangements as they are now are the best. But actually, it's in the end, for a very large number of reasons, it's all about what I have, I hold. Um, uh, I've seen so many examples of it. One, well, just take one obvious one. We, we began the process of unitary uh, councils in the counties in, in the... 90s, and there are quite a few unitary counties today. Nobody wants to bring back the districts. They're just a lot, they, they're just many tiers, too many people, too many competing influences, nobody in charge. I listened to the, the leader, the conservative leader of Essex the other day, talking about the problem of having 11 county, uh, councils within Essex. Um, and so, uh, yes, the human factor is absolutely dominant uh, and uh, coupled with another factor which is no one really cares that the number of people who are really interested in the structure of local government will just look at the turnout in the in the in the local elections uh, uh, we had a referenda about mayor tiny numbers of people voted uh, and most of them were driven by the local councillors defending their patches so I'm afraid you, you, there's no point in hiding these rather sad reflections. Um, we, we've known sensibly what we should have done since the 1960s, but we're only halfway there. Do you think, um, do you think the pol politics would ever align so that Boris would push through compulsory unitarization? Well, there's just there, another point you raised, which is, which is an, a very interesting one. Uh, by and large, there's a, not a bad division of uh, Conservative and Labour mayors across the country. Uh, uh, and, and there are some outstanding examples of, of how well the Conservatives are doing. Um, now, if you say, well, we can't risk going forward um, because they might be more Labour mayors, well, suppose there are more Labour mayors. That provides for the Labour Party a, a, a series of platforms, which uh, not for me to tell them what to do, but they don't need my guidance. They're clever enough people to work out for themselves how they do it. But if you, uh, and, and the less devolution you have, the more articulate they will be and with cause. The only way you can actually begin to counter that is either to win conservative uh, uh, mayor mayorities, uh, but what's the point of that if we don't give them powers, or, and this is my view is the real answer, you have to work in partnership with those mayors. And the truth is, that, again, I've had a lot of experience of this, that, that, that uh, uh, the, the, um, um, uh, the allocation of money um, in a devolved agenda makes it much easier for all parties to cooperate in determining how to spend it. Um, uh, again, I, uh, I took lonely decisions about this when uh, in the 1990s on the uh, City Challenge slum program clearance, I only awarded 10 packets of money out of 30 competing, competing local authorities. And that was highly controversial, but it proved immensely valuable because what happened is that 10 local authorities won and transformed their areas. The Hume Estate in Manchester, perhaps the best example. Um, but the ones that lost, once they got over the fact they'd lost, went off to find out how the others had won. 
and the second round was transformationally better. And the other thing that happened, just like the partnerships that we did in so many of these regeneration schemes, is that instead of shouting abuse at each other, businessmen and public sector people, labor and conservative, they actually had to sit down with a drawing board and work out plans that were gonna get money. And they all started to realize that party politics may have a role to play, but it's a relatively small part of economic regeneration. And they therefore concentrate on sensible, practical solutions. The fact they have to involve the universities, they have to involve the private sector, means that labor authorities are going to have to make sure that their plans stand up to local scrutiny. And don't forget, there's one person who has to get reelected. So all the sort of the, the, the petty side of party politics is, is a, quite a long way from the thinking of that person. They can't just concentrate on labor, uh, the, the heartlands. They have to get out where the, uh, the non-labor voters are uh, in order to make their appeal. So it, it, you can't run away from the devolution agenda. It's here and either the government are going to work with it and embrace it and take advantage of it, or it will become their enemy. And that I, I find fearful. Well, a couple of questions in, in relation to, to that. I mean, the, the government has uh, set up a, a large number of different funding pots to try and uh, achieve its leveling up um, objective which um, all of us would support. Well, at CPP, we, we definitely support the idea of, of levelling up, although we, we call it something different in inclusive growth. But we've got these different funds. Most of them are very capital intensive. Um, and um, some of them are speaking to, as we've said previously, perhaps too low a level of geography. But could you do, could, could, can the government feasibly do levelling up if it just focuses on that distribution of capital, essentially? Could it consider devolution as a second order issue and one that perhaps is too messy for all sorts of political and bureaucratic reasons? Well, I have always myself argued that the first and biggest opportunities for levelling up are with the capital agenda. Um, because basically you are investing. You, basically, I mean, it's very dangerous, these generalizations, but what you're doing in leveling up is you're taking communities which are declining in their attractiveness to people. Um, so the younger people leave, the people who can afford to leave, leave. You get it with, we had a deprived school, for example. Parents who want the best for their kids move to catchment areas for better schools. People who want to buy their own homes buy to move to the suburbs. And you get this vicious circle of decline. And the, 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 the way that you have to tackle that is investment. You have to clear the dereliction. You have to make them attractive places where people want to uh, invest. You have to make them where people want to live and want to buy homes, whatever it may be. Uh, so you have to have that, that, you have to reverse that vicious decline into a virtuous circle of expansion. And there are many ways of doing it, but the one thing is, in my view, clear, there's no common way of doing it because you have to look at the circumstances on the ground. You have to look at what strengths are available uh, to, to you as a leader of the, the initiative. Um, and, and that means mobilizing whatever is available to you, whether it's universities or hospitals or third sector or private sector or investors, whatever it may be, you have to be able to see a bigger picture. And, and, and that's why I, I'm, I'm so depressed by these endless proliferation of small schemes. You need a bigger vision covering what are definable economies. And again, it's all there in the Red Cliff Maud report. 60 unitary authorities is what we need. We have, we, we have over 300. And that's, that's, uh, that's not uh, the most effective way to, to manage this recovery. 
One uh, more question before I turn to our audience questions. You mentioned before about the um, impetus that the competitive bidding process played in enhancing the quality of those that you received. I wonder, just to be slightly controversial here, is do you think sort of local governments got wise to um, how they bid for, for, for these sorts of pots of money? And, and part and parcel of that is actually detrimental to what it is, the, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Because often, you know, people, essentially local government will write what it thinks central government wants to hear, rather than really looking, as you said earlier, about what it, what they need to do to really tailor the um, opportunities of their particular place based on their particular economic assets. Well, the more you have a functional um, bias, the more, it's possible to write your, your bidding uh, definition to meet the Whitehall Department whose money you're trying to get. Uh, uh, but of course, there will always be element in which anyone bidding for money will say, well, you know, how do we win this? And what do they want to hear? And there's bound to be an element of that. But uh, certainly, in my experience of playing some role in judging these competitive processes, it's amazing how when, the, when, when you get down to it, there's a great deal of common accord between central government and local government. Uh, if it's all determined on the back of party politics, well, of course, there's no meeting point. So it, it, it's no use sort of coming forward if you're a, a Labour authority saying, I'm going to turn this into a sort of a, a paradise for the left because you're not going to get support from the, the, the central government. And you, th this is not an absolute issue, this devolution issue. It, it is not a 100% transfer of power. You can't, as a central government, give up your responsibilities as a central government. So you have to recognise the real terms of the deal. And, and the deal is a partnership, but a partnership in my view, where the plans and the ideas and the drive and the responsibility start at the local level and not in Whitehall. Uh, and that's the fundamental. Now, if you are, if you're, as I say, if you had a hard left council and, and you came up with some ways of spending money, I'm not going to parody the situation, which was patently unattractive to a central conservative government, you're not going to get that much money. And, and you have to explain that to your local constituency. But my experience of all this bidding process is that this doesn't happen. And, and that, um, again, I, I would have to say that much of the regeneration that has taken place has taken place under Labour authorities. And uh, I, I only come back to my experience of, of Liverpool. And Liverpool is a place transformed. And uh, um, that has been done as a partnership between the Conservatives and the Labour Party in large measure. So it, I, I think you can exaggerate the risks of this, but the evidence on the ground, my word, you look at central Manchester, central Newcastle, central uh, the East End of London, uh, the, the, the incredible achievements of the City Challenge with, uh, in, in Leicester and in Manchester, uh, and you can see what can be done. Indeed, indeed. When I went, when the bomb outrage took place in Manchester, I went to uh, the then Labour leader, uh, Richard Lees, and uh, he asked me what I thought should happen. And I said, look, I think we should take the machinery used to develop the human state, the people in charge, the same public-private partnership, and help it to rebuild the centre of Manchester. And he said, at least at once. And we agreed. There was, never, there was never a moment's friction or disagreement. Well, I'm going to move to um, some questions that we've had from the audience, um, including um, from Poland. You said that there might be people watching from all around the world, and it seems that there are. Um, and I'm going to group that with a couple of other similar questions. So um, are there any role models of local government structures of the type you're describing in Europe or elsewhere, asked Marcin from Poland. And should there be a uniform pattern of devolution rather than the current patchwork in England? Do we need to neaten the map, as they, as they say? And what might this mean for Scotland and Wales? 
Oh, well, look, Europe is full of uh, evolved authorities. That's the basis on which they work in, 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 in Europe, uh, as well as in other parts of the world. One of the most uh, interesting formative experience I had was in Japan, in Hokkaido, the north tip of Northern Ireland, where they had a really dynamic mayor who was <laughs> a very impressive young man. Um, so uh, the model is everywhere except for here. Now, um, the model I would go for here is conurbation authorities, and we've got quite a few now. There are some we have not got, and I would name them as Nottingham Derby, uh, the Solent, the, 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 the South Hampshire, Portsmouth, Southampton, very much would benefit from a, from a conurbation authority. Um, uh, I would then go to unitary counties with directly elected mayors, and that would take us down to the sort of model of about 60 unitary authorities and, and the, uh, it would preserve the local loyalties of the, of the county structure and it would address the major conurbations that make up our country. In Scotland and Wales, I think there has been a devolution of Whitehall to Edinburgh and Cardiff and Belfast. Um, uh, and I, I would personally, if I was a conservative leader, in either of those, any one of those three areas, I would um, uh, I, I would go for a real devolution in Wales, for example, probably five authorities, Cardiff, Swansea, uh, Mid Wales, North Wales and Pembrokeshire. Uh, in Scotland, I would also go for uh, devolved authorities uh, of the sort that I've just described. Um, so I've got no doubt at all about the model that we should have. And you have, a, there was another question, what was that? Uh, wait, no, that, I think that's right. Oh, should it be, should it be uniform everywhere, essentially? Oh, yes. well, no, I've answered the that. Deal. There would be either conurbation mayoral authorities or, or unitary mayoral councils, yes. Um, one more question from Paul Morby, who's chair of the Southwest Lab. He wonders what your thoughts are on uh, LEPs and notes that governments uh, announced another review of them. So where do you see yes, things uh, I mean, going this, there? This is, a, this is a typical example of the boring nature of a party politics. Um, the point of the LEP is to involve the private sector within the municipal decision-making process. Now, they're not elected. I first recognize that. But creating a partnership is a very important part of getting the private sector involved in the process. And there are lots of things they can do, not just, not just in terms of uh, uh, um, doing the job they should be doing in making successful companies, but for example, our education system would benefit hugely from more governors on our schools from the private sector. After all, the private sector is gonna create a huge number of the jobs those kids are gonna go for. So, uh, tackling failing schools and bringing in experienced administrators from the universities, from, uh, from the private sector, is a very obvious and important indicator of what should be happening. In some places it is, but not enough. Um, so the partnership concept is, is important and the LEPs are a way of doing it. Of course, there are not every lap is as good as another. Well, to which the solution is answered. Make them better. Just, you know. But the, the, the idea of the review, so everybody loses faith, uh, then you have a change and you have new people, and then someone comes along and says, no, that's not working either. It, it, is, it is so typical of the way in which governments, sometimes within governments, sometimes different ministers, can sort of change fundamentally the policy that is being adopted. And this is, this is debilitating, frankly. Uh, well, one of our questions actually relates something, uh, relates closely to that. Um, Paul says, in, in Germany, it's compulsory to be a member of a chamber of commerce. In the UK, it's optional. Um, do you think a compulsory employer membership for chambers or potentially sort of some kind of compulsory connection to the LEP might um, bolster that? business engagement and cooperation? Well, I personally would strongly support that. And uh, uh, the, the, the fact is, I mean, I can give you a, 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 an example again of, of this situation. I was on Humberside um, and it was in Hull, I think, and um, uh, talking about this issue. 
you have the Chambers of Commerce, you have the Federation of Small Businesses, you had the Empl Engineering Employers Federation, you had the CBI, and you had the Institute of Directors. And, and they all do their thing and they, 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 they have a role to play. But if you add the whole lot together, they represented on in the occasion I'm talking about, about 20% of the companies involved in the area. And frankly, they will be the best companies, the biggest companies. And that's not where the problem is. And amongst our best companies are world beating exporting companies. The problem is at the bottom end. First of all, we create, we're very good at creating new businesses, but we're not good at creating them into medium businesses. And, uh, and there isn't any effective support um, to help the young entrepreneur survive to the medium entrepreneur. Uh, so the, the lot fall by the wayside. But huge numbers of companies simply don't get involved in the wider economic opportunities of their area. Uh, and, and then if you add to that, well, um, uh, you, look at the, you look at the German chambers, uh, they are hugely rich, not just in the way they operate in Germany, but the way they operate across the world. We have no comparable scale of support for our export industries as the Germans do, uh, and I suspect the French do and many others. Um, so putting together some structure that brings the private sector into a much more formidable and resourceful cooperation would to me be a very important part. Uh, and of course, if you say to me, do the LEPs fulfill that? No, they don't. But so if the structure that was in mind was to go further and get closer to the continental model, I would support it. Thank you. Um, London has been a city that's been, um, it, this, whose private sector has been particularly impacted by the pandemic. Um, one of our audience members asks um, whether um, the settlement with London is currently being undermined. That's from Richard Derecki. Does devolution elsewhere undermine the London exceptionalism might be another way of putting it. Well, and is that I, a good thing? I, I, I am. I think the media have not been as wide awake as they should have been in some respects. The levelling up agenda has too easily become more money for the North. Now, I actually am a sceptic about the idea that you can level up the North by holding back the rest of the country. I think that uh, we are an inter interrelated economy and that the way to get growth in the North is to make sure that the rest of the economy is flourishing as well. Uh, but I also believe that uh, you have to look to see what more can be done in the southeast to ensure that that is flourishing as well. And I give them in a, again another depressing example of how opportunities are being missed. Uh, I had the privilege of being chairman of a, uh, um, a, an estuarial commission under George Osborne. Um, and um, I have no doubt at all what, what is needed there. Um, because some of the most acute areas of deprivation in the country are to be found, for example, in Kent. Um, but you've now got a, 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 a very worthy lady leading a committee, but without any powers, without any resources. And uh, it's typical of, of how we never follow things through. Um, uh, and certainly if I had anything to do with it, I would immediately recreate the development corporation uh, which would have a massive effect on uh, Essex, Kent, and, and uh, the, the, the East London boroughs. Um, uh, the model is, is, was there when we did it in the inner London boroughs. We now need to extend it to the coast. Um, uh, and, and I haven't the slightest doubt that uh, uh, that, that would be a very beneficial to the British economy, but also to the levelling up agenda. Um, that leads me to a, a related question from Guy Cowley, who asked about the role of pan-regional partnerships. Um, do you think uh, something like a kind of southeast partnership would 
equivalent to the Northern Powerhouse be one way of, of facilitating what you just described? And, and what role do you think others such as the Northern Powerhouse should play in supporting the kind of combined authority model? Well, the Southeast Partnership, is that the name of the, um, uh, the, the committee that is now dealing with East London? Uh, I'm not sure about that. The, the, no, there was a, the old RDA was the Southeast SEEP, I think. Oh, this is, yes, this is a much bigger, yes, yeah, much bigger. Well, I, I myself think that uh, um, uh, my concentration would be on unitary counties and a major development area for from East London to the coast. Um, I think that that would that that would be what is needed today, and um, it would have um, I think very satisfactory results. Well, the the Northern Powerhouse and Midlands Engine have become iconic around the idea of of leveling up, haven't they? What what role do you think they can play in in supporting that? Well, again, you see, this is where I think that that. Uh, uh, the, the focus has become too easily on the northern powers. Now, no one is keener than I am on helping the, the, the economies of the north. Um, but I, I don't believe in a policy which ignores or, or, or downgrades or even puts in second gear the economies of the Midlands, of the, of, uh, the southwest uh, uh, or, or the east Midlands or, or London. Uh, I think you want to, you, you, you want an economy which is sparking in all its cylinders. It, it, all parts of it ought to be given every maximum encouragement. And, and they're all interrelated as each one of them, if one of them does well, it will spill over to the others. If they're all doing well, it will spill dramatically into the country itself. But uh, the, so, I, I don't myself uh, think it's right to be talking about the Northern Powerhouse as though that is the objective. The objective is to make this country more prosperous and uh, to achieve higher living standards across the country. And, and uh, that requires uh, setting these fires alight from one end of the country to the other. Here's where politics, though, strikes again, because there, there are arguably trade-offs um, for both Labour and, and the Conservative Party and thinking about how they win in 2024 and target those former Red Wall seats with kind of very tangible, visible regeneration projects. You know, the High Streets Fund is, Future High Streets Fund is potentially one avenue for that. Um, you know, those sort of short-term projects, arguably, or superficial projects versus other forms of, re of real levelling up, not just in the North, but elsewhere in the country, as you say. Yes, well, the, the, um, uh, the High Street Fund, that's a classic example of, of a sticking plaster being put on, um, you know, Whitehall has come up with some bright wheeze as to what to do. We may well be facing transformational change in the High Streets, and it may well be that the right approach is to have a strategic assessment of the role of the high street within the local economy. And you, it may well be that as part of that, very significant planning changes will be required, much more flexible land use. Um, but I would not myself believe you can do that just by looking at the high street. Um, I mean, I haven't myself had to look at this problem, so I, I don't come forward with a range of proposals. But uh, what I, if I was minister today, faced with that, I would call in the, the leaders of the conurbation authorities and said, what is your strategy for your area? And they couldn't ignore the high street, because that's after all where a huge number of jobs and, and, uh, and activities take place. Um, so let them work out the best way of doing it. Now, I don't know what the answers would be. And, and, and indeed, I make a virtue of that, because that's exactly the mistake I'm trying to argue against of me centrally, a, 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 an ex-minister, devising schemes for Manchester or Birmingham or Tees Valley, wherever it is. I don't want to do that. I want them because they, they're there. And, and they're big people, they're, they're, you know, they're important people, they're, 
captains of industry, there's local councillors, there's vice chancellors. These are serious people. Uh, and, and they they there use their talents. And, and of course, not just use their talents, but use their money. Because one of the other things that I believe strongly about in the B generation thing is that we you use money from government competitively based on what the local people will add to what the government taxpayers can afford. That has been, a, a, in, in, even in Liverpool, in the darkest days of 1980, we got one and a half pounds of extra money from the private sector for every pound that the taxpayers spent. In London, Docklands, we were getting 10 pounds of private money for every pound of public money. So gearing, partnership, competition, challenge, these things are built into the, the, the track record of success of regeneration. But the government has, has lost the will to see the vision that is possible. Sandra Booth's asked about the abolish, abolition of the Industrial Strategy Council. Um, and this means we assume the idea of local industrial strategy is de being dead in the water. What do you think about that? And what do you think, what sort of other vehicles do you think local places can be using to go through that process of identifying what's needed and, and, and engaging with, with business? Well, my heart sinks. I mean, what, how, can you, how can you be seriously uh, considering getting rid of an industrial strategy? It, it, industrial strategy is all around you. It is the, 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 the A, B, and C of economic activity. Um, uh, what it, let's say what it isn't. It is not about throwing money at bad companies, propping up failing businesses. It doesn't do that at all. The first thing for an industrial strategy, the, the beginning in, of it all, is education and skills. I mean, what's the point of having a thriving economy if you're not training the children to take an advantage of it by getting a job in it? Uh, what, how can you square yourself with the idea that the people who create the jobs play practically no part in designing or advising the education people. How can you live with that? And then you go to the other end of the scale. Um, well, how much do the Chinese and the Americans spend on high technology support for their economies? And the figures are astronomical. Uh, we have to compete with that. And so, uh, how do we compete with it? Well, the only way you can compete with it is find ways of getting some money. And you can do it within with investment. We, we've now put up barriers called Brexit to that. You can do it by sharing your relationships with like-minded people. Brexit, of course, fractures the European vision. Um, uh, so uh, you've got to have some pretty good ideas. And the idea that they're going to be designed by civil servants or ministers in London is just for the birds. Uh, you've really got to mobilize Britain's best talents and um, put people in charge to drive the agenda. Uh, I'm repeating myself, but, it, uh, but when I saw, <laughs> when I, <laughs> the trouble of having lived as long as I have is that I've seen I mean, Rad Butler, one of the great figures of the Tory party recovery after the Second World War, created one of the most talented conservative research departments. And what did they come up with? They came up with an industrial strategy. Harold Macmillan, arguably one of the great post-war prime ministers, created an industrial strategy as a conservative. Um, uh, John May, uh, David Cameron, uh, moved from a hesitancy uh, about the words industrial strategy. He wouldn't let me use the word industrial strategy when I did my report called No Stone Unturned. Uh, eventually we reached a compromise, which is we could use the industrial strategy words in the context of other countries' industrial strategies. But anyway, David ended up praising industrial strategies. Um, and uh, um, uh, Theresa May wanted an industrial strategy. 
And now we're not going to have an industrial strategy. But the facts that make up an industrial strategy, our education, our skills, our investment programs, our tax regimes, our regulation regimes, are all part of an industrial strategy. You can't escape from it. As anyone who's been a minister for any period of time knows that day after day after day, you have to make decisions that affect the industrial strategic interests of this country. We are unfortunately running out of time, but I just want to pick up on one of, of the points you just made there and, and a few questions we've had um, from Will Mapplebeck at Core Cities and Greg Parston, both speaking to the idea about um, tax and redistribution, essentially. Um, do you think council tax is still fit for purpose? And, and what, do you, what are your views on fiscal devolution? And also, to what extent should government be more transparent about the distribution of local government finance, whether that's raised locally or otherwise? Well, um, council tax is, it works. It collects a lot of money. It, it, of course, suffers from the old problem of the rates that you don't revalue because that immediately causes you devastating electoral consequences. But um, at least it works. And um, the, the, a problem we have in this country is we're so small that we're so close together. So if you're going to have tax devolution to local authorities, Will people actually know which local authority is raising the tax or not? Now, the more you go to a conurbation authority, it becomes uh, more defensible. And there are taxes, that, like tourist tax, for example, uh, that you can uh, much more easily identify at a local level. Um, so I, I wouldn't change the council tax myself until I saw something better. Um, and, and I myself wouldn't get involved in the great reorganization of the tax regimes at a local level because it will take an age, <laughs> it'll end, <coughs> excuse me, it'll create great uncertainty and it will create huge controversy. And that's, we've got controversy enough without adding to it at the moment. And fiscal devolution, if I could just push you on that. Now, the fiscal devolution, well, that, uh, that's what I'm talking about. I just, it, it's too complicated to take on at the moment. Um, and you don't need, if you concentrate on the, uh, on the, um, uh, the, the capital budget com competitive distribution, you have a very powerful weapon. Mind you, I do think that the, uh, there was a change, which I did approve of, where they uh, <coughs> devolved power over business rates. And, and gave a, a lot of incentive to companies, to local authorities to keep the benefits. But, but you still have to have equalization uh, because there are such disparities of wealth. Yes, and, um, and on that we should probably end because despite decades of uh, attempts to tackle those disparities of wealth across the country, we are still um, trying to uh, achieve the, the closing of those gaps. And that's what we are committed to do at the Centre for Progressive Policy. I'm sure that's what you'll continue to think about, Lord Heseltine. Um, both through devolution and through other means. And we just sort of say thank you for your um, reflections, your insights and um, your time today. So huge thank you from us. Um, just a plug for our next event, which is actually with um, Tracy Braben MP. And she's the Labour candidate for the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Um, so that event from, mayor, from MP to Mayor, uh, please sign up now on CPP's website. Um, but as you can hear, my clock is striking and telling us we're out of time. So I'll say bye-bye for now. Thank you, everyone, for watching.